it was the first propaganda film that the British public had ever seen. My father, he died just before war was declared. But because of that, the family home was sold. My mother went home to live with her mother and I was put into digs. No social life, no family, living in a strange house. It won a low ebb, I suppose you could say, in my personal life. I was in a very junior position, and I was the job was was termed a loader. Basically, it's the lowest job in the sound department. And it was my job to go into all the trucks, all the productions, and keep them supplied with full magazines uh, on a daily, on an hourly basis. So I had to go chase all around the studio, visiting all the productions, and put new magazines, bring the full ones away, send it off to the whichever laboratory was handling that film. I was rather young at the time. I mean, 1939, I was only 18. When uh, war came, which was uh, a Sunday, we happened to be all working overtime outside to catch the sunshine, which was rare in those days. And uh, immediately when we heard war was declared, shooting was stopped and all the extras in the Arabian scene, they were all brought back into the studio to fill sandbags around the studio entrance in case there was a sudden enemy attack. The film was uh, ceased. Uh, it didn't start up again after the Sunday. It was the first propaganda film that the British public had ever seen. It was uh, done in a rather unconventional fashion in that they had about five units working on it and it was shot in about seven, seven or eight days. And the whole thing was very quickly put together, music composed, and it was out in the cinemas in about a month's time. It was very, very fast. The, f the film showed Wellington bombers on a raid on Germany. And the raid was successful and everybody came back and they hit the target. And there was, a, was quite a speech about freedom and how we wish to live. And would you like to live under Hitler or not? Later on, Germans made a raid on England. Of course, they all got shot down. Hitler got to hear about this, and he said, he said, get me a copy, I want to show it to Goebbels, and tell him to see it and find out what he's up against when we go to England. He ended his uh, little speech by saying, and if, if, I, if I ever find out the studio that made it, he said, I will bomb that out studio. We were mainly contributing to information. The Ministry of Information would put films into cinemas that we were making. The army looked after its troops wherever it went. There was a thing called the Army Kinematograph Corps that provided film shows, and ENSA provided film shows to the army and services. They would use the films that we produced. But films were always biased. Uh, the British were the good boys and they always won. You know, so sometimes it was not really true to life, but um, all was well received in cinemas. What I can remember of going to the cinema in those days that uh, got a bit of a cheer sometimes, which was rather nice. The film that I liked working on was, was one of our aircraft was missing. The sound editor on the film had absolutely no material to work from. So we were instructed to go and find some. We were using a Wellington bomber. So it was one of my first trips of flying uh, with the sound camera between my knees with headphones on. 
with not much room in a Wellington. It's, it's, it's hard, hardly big enough for the crew, let alone a sound crew plus. On another occasion, we crowned film unit were making a film called Western Approaches about the convoys crossing the Atlantic under great difficulty and being attacked by submarines. And they wanted the sound effect of a submarine sitting on the seabed being depth charged. Uh, obviously, there's nothing of that nature available. So the sound editor said, the only way I can do that is to do it for real. So a few telephone calls to the Navy to lay on the, the event. And I found myself off to Scotland, located the submarine, and went around one of the locks, sat on the bottom, and a destroyer came up, dropping depth charges from a distance of two miles, getting closer and closer. And when they were overhead, they dropped another one, and really, I wasn't very happy about that. But we really got a very clear recording of the, of the depth charges, and also the cavitation of the propellers as they went over our submarine, really crystal clear. Some, of, some, some sound effects you have to do for real. That was one of them. And uh, the only compensation was when we surfaced with lots of dead fish on the sea, on the lock, so we had some nice fresh fish for lunch. There was a request came into Pinewood Studios to prepare sound equipment and send it abroad with, a, with an operator. I took a night sailing on a landing craft with this thing and I had to report to a Captain Peter Hanford, the other side of the channel. And we spent six months touring the various battlefields, recording whatever sound was available. We were in front of the guns, firing over our heads and over our troops into the German position. And likewise, the Germans were firing back. The German machine guns, called the Spandau, had a very rapid rate of fire. So if you heard machine gun, you knew immediately if it was one of ours or one of theirs. And they had another, another ghastly weapon called the Nebelwerfer. Nebelwerfer was a six or eight multiple mortar gun. That was deadly too. And I can tell you categorically, never once was I frightened by anything. The only one, one time, probably, in a village in Germany. And Peter Hanford had gone on to take some photographs. And I'd just driven the truck into a garage and I'd, I'd got the, set the mic up outside. And uh, I just put some headphones on and I thought, this sounds interesting. And then I just started recording and an 88 millimeter shell hit the building next door. Peter Hanford heard this turn round and saw a great big pall of smoke where I was, and thought, oh my goodness, I'll have to write to his mother. But in actual fact, I survived it. And the sound effect is one of my favorites, actually. And I even know the number, 187, effects 187, is a mortar shell landing. And there aren't many recordings of that. But one thing it did prove is that when a, when a shell is approaching you, you don't hear it. You won't, the only time you hear it is in films where they put a big whistle in which lasts several seconds. A, sh a shell coming down on top of you, and you, that's it. Very quick. Everything makes its own spectacular sound. Now, whether that's over the heads of the general public, it probably is. It matters to me immensely. It proves it to be authentic. As soon as you put the actual sound, you're there. It's with you. You're not just looking at a silent bit of image. You're 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 almost there with the with the mortar standing there, what listening to it, holding your ears. To be honest with you, I was quite. I shouldn't say this, but I was enjoying myself. I was doing something I liked and something worthwhile, and. Um, I was enjoying what I did. <laughs>